again, New Age bookshops, there's the immensely sort of popular beliefs in angels, fairies and elves and all sorts of little creatures like that, aliens of various types, all these channeled entities, and you could go on. I mean, there's this proliferation of, uh, of entities. And then, of course, there's a sort of big general sort of popular interest in, in ghosts and spirits and ancestors and things like this that might be impinging on this realm. So do you see all of that stuff as just kind of confused refractions of some something like what you were describing? Do you, I mean, what, what do you make of all? What, what do you think these things are? The stuff, you know, I asked this already, it's hard to <laughs> pin it down, but the stuff that these channelers are, are channeling or the, the, when people sincerely claim to have mm. an encounter with an angel or... Well, I think it's extremely difficult to say. I think, I think it's a kind of co-created process. I don't believe that human beings you know, kind of clear a kind of tabula rasa in their minds and then something just comes through of something mm. which they, they have no responsibility in kind of create, half creating, as it were. Mm. Um, I was very struck by um, Myers' description of, of telepathic processes. Oh, which Myers is this? It's Frederick Myers, okay. who was um, a psychical researcher end of the last end of the 19th century right. beginning of the 20th century um, and he uh, he did a lot of uh, extensive work on survival of um, spirit after bodily death and then when he died um, he supposedly channeled lots of information back through a famous medium called Geraldine Cummins okay. in I think 1930 or so and it's fascinating reading because he's describing in great detail the mechanism by which he, as a spirit, you know, makes contact with with the medium, and he says it's like um, it's like thought forms penetrating through um, the mind of the medium, and, and the medium's mind has to be the kind of mind that's open to this sort of penetration. But the medium clothes the thought forms okay. in their own particular way of expressing them. Yeah. So. Although something may be coming through the medium, it's not just pure, it's not just the voice of the spirit coming straight through, that it has to come through the personality mm. of the medium. And ultimately the language structures. And the language and the, structures. Yeah. So there's a tremendous amount of, of sort of co-cooperation mm. needed here. And what comes through may have all sorts of distortions and all sorts of overlays yeah. by the what's receiving it. So I think it's it's that sort of thing probably that's going on a lot. Mm. There are all sorts of assumptions and suppositions which start influencing and people start assuming that because they hear a voice or something it must be that, an alien. Yeah, and it, it has its, its own yeah, it sort of has its own integrity, so therefore it must be real and it and, and they write it down word for word and this is the truth now. This is And what if the they've been are. reading in a certain area or if they've been brought up in a certain way or yeah. in a certain tradition, they will assume that that's what it is that's mm. that's speaking to them. Yeah. So, I mean, famously, the mo I think in the 90s, I think one of the big channeled, um, uh, one of the sort of sensations in channeled literature was Barbara Marciniak's channeling the Pleiadians. And I, I dipped into this, and there were, you know, these supposed beings from, you know, the Pleiades star system were using metaphors involving credit cards and things like that. And I just thought, <laughs> and, and it just the whole thing had this kind of slick Californian sort of, yes. I just thought, I don't think an alien consciousness would talk like this, but it did occur to me that perhaps there was something, there was something coming through and the contents of her mind, her mm. slick Californian mind full of credit cards and things, just kind of glommed onto that and gave it a form. Um, I think that, that's kind of what must be happening and, and again the problem is if you're not trained or you're not able to, to, to see this as a metaphor for something mm. then it tends to become literal reality. Yeah. And if you look at the evolution of, you know, um, UFO, UFO encounters, um, encounters with supposed yeah, extraterrestrials, you'll notice that from the 1950s into the present, the way that, you know, again, I, I'm just assuming that the people describing these encounters aren't fraudulent, that they actually, they had an experience, they've, they don't know what it is, and they're, they're, they're reporting it as well as they can. And the aliens in the 50s tended to be beautiful humanoids with long blonde hair and blue eyes who claimed to be from Venus. And then when it's our astronomical you know, data got a bit better and we sort of came to realise that Venus probably wasn't inhabited by anything like that, they started being these little grey, you know, skinny things from Zeti Reticula, 
you know, considerably further away. And also the, the spaceships that they came in, you know, in the 50s there were these sleek kind of 1950s sort of Buck Rogers style rocket ships. And then, you know, and they gradually became, the design changed over, over a few decades. The designs sort of followed the design trends on Earth, which doesn't make any sense at all if you literally believe these things are coming from other well, places. I suppose, you know, Jung would be the person to go back to here and the mm. idea of, of unconscious, um, sort of, unconscious metaphors, I suppose, or unconscious images that, that, that sort of flow on some level and inform all aspects of, of our reality. Mm. Therefore, they're going to appear in fashion, they're going to appear in, you know, the kind of aliens we think about, they're going to, you know, literature, yeah. you know, they're going to be these sort of waves of, of different kind of powerful images that are going to yeah. grab us. Yeah, I, I, I completely accept that. But what was interesting was Terence McKenna's um, take on, on the alien abduction thing McKenna pointed out was that people who had no previous interest in this, who'd not watched any of the TV programmes or read any of the books, were having these encounters of thinking they'd been abducted and were describing in great detail, um, sometimes under hypnotic regression, things which other people had described. And this was fueling this, he thought, misguided belief that there was an objective reality to that there were actual physical beings coming from other planets abducting us. He believed it was all going on within some kind of psychic realm. Um, informed by his experiences with, with psychedelics like DMT, he believed that people were encountering entities that inhabit some sort of in-between world. It takes us back to the Mundus Yeah, lives. yeah, very much so. But he, he, he argued, yeah, because he argued that there was a kind of... The reason why people were reporting that, that the aliens they saw were very similar to the aliens other people had seen with no communication between, between these various people was that there was, a, there was this kind of cultural reservoir, he believed, of imagery. And so, for example, in the late 70s, um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind was, you know, it was a huge film, lots of people saw it. It sort of, Spielberg basically handed us an idea of what, what aliens would look like and what their spacecraft would look like. And, and even people who didn't see that and had no interest in that kind of film, um, when they had a, a, you know, through some kind of, um, you know, McKenna believed it was a sort of self-induced uh, DMT experience that the brain you know, under a certain type of stress through tiredness or fear could generate a powerful psychedelic substance and then the person having that experience, having, you know, having not actually willfully, consciously taken some drug, you know, they, the only way they can explain this strange experience they had where they encountered entities, it felt more real than this. The entities were in these, you know, technological sort of vessels. And what they were describing, um, he claimed, was both coming from this cultural reservoir, which is continually evolving. So the 1950s cultural reservoir came from sort of 50s B-movies and that kind of thing. And it's just gradually being updated with all the sci-fi literature and all the blockbuster films and everything. And every time someone has the experience and reports it and it ends up in a TV documentary or a book or a magazine, it feeds back further into that reservoir and it reinforces itself. So we've got this kind of self reinforce So every, every era has been doing this and so people in the Middle Ages might have had the same experiences, but they would have been taken into the underworld by the fairies. And people back then knew what the fairies were like because enough people had the experiences that they could describe how they dressed, what their underworld, you know, feasts were like, you know, how they behaved, what their music was like, that kind of thing. It ended up in folklore, it, then, you know, the kids heard the stories, it all got reinforced, um, and, and on it goes. But ultimately, behind the imagery is some sort of essence that there are presences, consciousness is something, disembodied parts of our individual psyches or collective psyche, I don't know what it is, but we, we clothe them, we, we clothe them and we don't just do it individually, we do it mm. collectively. Is that, you'd, you'd agree that's, um, that's, that's, that ties in with the Mundus Imaginalis to some extent then? Yes, although with the Mundus Imaginalis it's very much that that is a level which leads you to um, a kind of spiritual development. Mm. You know, so the Mundus Imaginalis would be um, would be the kind of visionary experience which enables you to you know, become more whole in some way. These fragmentary experiences, yeah. these kind of like these sort of distortions and kind of weird and wonderful experiences, which don't seem to take anyone anywhere or lead to anything apart from you know confusion, confusion and sensation. Yeah. Would this this Corbin would say this is the end of our modern age you know, mm. because. It, it, they are like distortions of an experience which 
ideally should be contained and channeled in a right. different kind of way. And, and he believed that a religious tradition was the, the most reliable way yes, of containing Yes, because that. in essence, religion is about connecting back to this deeper source of being, which we mm. all come from, where we'll all go to. So you know, the kind of visionary experiences in this life, which begin to connect you back to that, have an ultimately a sort of soteriological purpose. You know, this is to do with the saving of the soul. Yeah. Whereas some of these other these other visions, you know, nothing to do with saving your soul. They probably more to do with with, with fragmenting it and, mm. and causing problems. So, you know, there's a great danger in just letting these images right. completely loose. So, for people watching who who understand what you're saying, who who understand the dangers involved here, and who who are concerned that we we really need to start constructing some sort of container whereby we can work in, in these realms and, and, and move forward towards some sort of unification or development of the soul, I mean to use these words very loosely, what, what are the options if we, if we want to be able to get well, back to that? I think there is something new emerging and I think it's, it, it, again, it, it's what, what um, Geoffrey Kripal, who you've probably gathered, is one of my favourite writers mm. on all this, um, would talk about as a third way or he talks about as a third classroom in his um, books that goes beyond what he would call a classroom of faith and a classroom of reason. So we've, in fact, we've been through the kind of faith claims of all the different um, the religious adherents who, who believe their particular way has been the ultimate truth. That's not going to work. Mm. We've been through the kind of rational re-readings of everything, reducing, reducing all these kind of experiences to something else, you know, saying they're either rational or they're brain waves or whatever it may be, we've been through all the reductive rational re-readings and they, that doesn't lead us anywhere either. So he's suggesting we actually need a third approach now which is um, much more about this, the idea of moving towards what is, what, is the, what is consciousness that's expressing itself through all these different ways. So it's now trying to stand back from um, seeing all these individual positions as any kind of ultimate truths. Mm -hmm to these are all just ways in which human beings try to process this other thing, call it consciousness if you like, and in order to try and understand that we've got to really start reflecting on our own assumptions and our own, you know, critically under looking at ourselves looking as it were. So um, it, this is what he calls a kind of postmodern gnosis. Mm. So instead of feeling we can just go back to a religious tradition which of course there are extremely enlightened people in many religious traditions, it's not, not there aren't people working mm. in this way, but um, I think he's thinking much more of a sort of holistic way of, of combining, you know, new moves in, in science, like um, in new physics, you know, with mystical experiences, with accounts of the paranormal. He's very, very keen on um, seeing the connections between sacred mystical experience and paranormal experience, which tend to not to be mm. understood as part of the same process. Um, and just moving forwards in our in our understanding of how we participate in a greater consciousness. Right. I um, can see people doing that individually, but in this third classroom, is it ever going to have a a cultural sort of status, a framework, an institutional frame? Is is that what he's talking about? Is he talking about building something together, or is it just everyone? Yes, everyone? he's talking about getting undergraduates really to start moving through this process. Okay. Um, particularly when they're studying subjects okay. like religious studies. So almost mutating the academy into something more, more Which organic. Which I would say help. is what we are trying to do, or we're, we're trying to get a feel for doing in, right. in our MA programme. Well, that's quite a good place to wrap things up then. So if, if you're interested in what we're talking about, and you're in, you, if you're in, in um, this part of the world, then um, check out on, on the blog, website address there, um, Angela's MA course in cosmology. Myth, cosmology. Myth, sorry, I got the order wrong. Myth, cosmology, <laughs> cosmology and the sacred. And, the sacred. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Thanks very much to Angela for being involved. Thank you, Matthew. And uh, here's another moment of ecological wonderment.